Well, thank you, Brother Bob, and uh, good morning, brethren and sisters. I bring with me the loving and fraternal greetings of your brothers and sisters who meet at the Morton Bay Ecclesia. They have long since had their memorial meeting, and it's their time to be resting. Brothers and sisters, we've been looking at John chapter 6 in various ways over the course of this weekend, and we want to now look at the fourth and fifth signs which occur in the early part of John chapter 6 and see that they're all, of course, based upon those things that we've seen as the background of John chapter 6. Isaiah 54, 55, the development of the children of Zion from both Jew and Gentile. And so when you come to the very first verse of John 6, you're reminded of that because it says, after these things, Jesus went over the sea of Galilee. Now we know from Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 1 that Galilee is called Galilee of the Nations. So it's clear that this is intended because it then says, we don't need to know this, do we? Which is the Sea of Tiberias. Now, Tiberias means pertaining to the river Tiber. In other words, where Rome is built. So clearly the Lord Jesus Christ has in mind the inclusion of Gentiles as this context is going to proceed. And it says a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, as the word should be, which he did on them that were diseased or feeble, as the Greek has it. And Jesus went up into not a mountain, but the mountain. So he goes into the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And I think probably some of you will at least be aware that what follows here in the fourth sign of John's Gospel, the feeding of the 5,000, is a, you might say, a practice run for the upper room for the memorial feast. That's what it is. The feeding of the 5,000 is a practice run for the memorial feast in the upper room, which is why he goes into a mountain and he sits there with his disciples. Now, what time of the year is it? Well, verse 4 tells you, and the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. It's Passover time. So you, you begin to understand where this is going. And we're going to see in a moment that the words that are used in the Greek for the feeding of the 5,000, are all used in the records, in the Gospels, of the, the, the feast in the upper room, when the Lord gathered his disciples together to do what, of course, we're doing again here today. So it's very, very appropriate for exhortation, this particular section uh, of Scripture. So with that background, we come and we see that in this feeding of the 5,000, the memorial feast is prefigured. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company coming unto him, he said unto Philip, Philip. Now, I wonder why he chooses Philip. Of all of the 12 disciples, why would he choose Philip? Well, he's not going to choose Judas Iscariot because Judas Iscariot is the only disciple from Judea. He's going to choose Philip because Philip just happens to have a Gentile name. He's a Gentile name. It means horses. It's a Greek name is Philip. And of course there was a man called Philip who had a son called Alexander. You remember him. So the Lord again chooses this, this connection with the Gentiles when he says to Philip, whence shall we buy bread? And we know that that phrase, straight out of, of Isaiah 55 and verse 1, buy grain or buy bread, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, well, 200 penny worth, which is, of course, uh, the, a long period. That's eight months wages to a Jew. Eight months wages is not going to be enough to buy sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Well, there's a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. Now, I want to, I want to just dig down into what these barley loaves represent in the scheme of things. But take the two fishes first. What do fish symbolise in the word of God? Well, go back to Genesis chapter 1. Remember, the fish of the sea. So the fish represent people in the sea of nations. Well, why are there two? Well, because you see Jew and Gentile. So what about five barley loaves? Five the number of grace. Well, we need to go back and have a look at Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 10 and 11. So come back with me. Hold John 6 if you can. Leviticus chapter 23. 
Here we have the feasts, of course, of Israel. And we read in verse 10, just after the record of the Passover feast, which we have between verses 4 and 8 of Leviticus 23, verse 10 says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So what kind of sheaf was that? Well, it was barley. It was barley that was being harvested at the time of Passover. The wheat didn't come until 50 days later. At the Feast of Weeks, remember, they, they were harvesting the wheat. So barley was the first. And of course, they had to offer this, this sheaf of the first fruits. Look at verse 11. And ye shall wave the sheaf, and the wave offering, of course, spoke of consecration to Yahweh. Ye shall wave the sheaf before Yahweh to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. It means, of course, the Sabbath that followed the Passover. And actually, in actual fact, if you take, if you include, you use the inclusive method and you take the 14th of Abib, the day of Passover, this is the third day. So you've got three days involved here, see. So there's the, all these little clues. Now, we know what this means. We don't have to argue about this because the Apostle Paul tells us what it means in 1st of Corinthians chapter 15. When he says in verse 23, Christ, the first fruits. He says, every man in his own order, because he's talking about resurrection, every man in his own order, resurrection, Christ, the first fruits. So when they took the barley sheaf, When they harvested the barley at the time of Passover and they waved this before Yahweh, it was speaking eloquently of the resurrection. Firstly, the resurrection of Christ. And of course, when they came to the Feast of Weeks and there were two barley loaves, etc., that was Jew and Gentile. Christ, the first fruit. So it's got to do with resurrection. And you know, when you come back to John chapter 6, you can see why he then says in John 6 these words. You come back to John 6 and have a look at what he says in verses 39... Uh, down through to verse 44. Verse 39 of John 6, And this is the Father's will which he which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, and he means Jew and Gentile, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Yeah, raise it up. See, he's got resurrection in mind. And this is clearly in his thinking, because in verse 40, This is the will of him that has sent me, that everyone... Jew and Gentile, which seeth the Son and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He goes on to say this in verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him or drag him by the power of the word, he means, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then comes that verse where he quotes, from Isaiah 54 and verse 13. They shall all be taught of God. You get the idea? You see what's happening here? You see what the Lord, where the Lord's mind is? So when we've got these barley loaves in John chapter 6 and verse 9, that's what it's speaking about. The first fruits and two small fishes to represent Jew and Gentile. So in verse 10 of John 6 we read, And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so it's the time of harvest, you see. There's all this, in fact, Mark's record, Mark 6.39, says there was green grass. So there's a lot of life being shown around here. This is the time of harvest. And he made the men sit down. And the men that sat down in number were about 5,000. Now, in, in the Greek, if you had a very literal translation, it would read this way. Five times a thousand. Now, a thousand to a Jew represented a family. You might remember when Gideon was approached by the angel and he said, thou mighty man, and Gideon said, you mean me? He says, my family is the least in Manasseh. That word family just happens to be the Hebrew word thousand. Because you see, in the Hebrew, one represents God or the father of a family, and a thousand represents the family. So a thousand come from him, see? So when you read of this five times a thousand, what do you reckon that might mean? Well, you see, these five thousand represent the family of grace. 
five being the number of grace. That's what the Lord's doing here, brothers and sisters, and he makes them sit down on an eminence, just like the disciples were to sit in the upper room. Now, the words that are used here hereafter are used in the records of the feast, the Last Supper, in the upper room. I want to show you just how fulsome this is. Just When we read this, just think about the records of the upper room. Verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves. It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down. Now, that word took, lambano, is used in Matthew 26, verse 26, Mark 14, verse 22, Luke 22, verses 17 and 19, and 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and 24. And you'll know that all of those are the records of the feast, the Last Supper. The word that you read in that verse, given thanks, Eucharistio, is used in Matthew 26, 27, Mark 14, 23, Luke 22, 17 and 19, and 1 of Corinthians 11, verse 24. You would look at the word that follows in verse 11. They were set down. That, that word, one word in the Greek, is rendered sat in Matthew 26, verses 7 and 20, Mark 14 and verse 18, sitteth in Luke 22, verse 27, leaning, you know how... Peter was leaning on the breast of Christ, on the chest of Christ, as he used to recline, leaning in John 13, verse 23, and at the table in John 13, 28. You can't miss this. I mean, these are the words that are used in the upper room. So when he feeds the 5,000, it's a practice run. He's setting forth what was going to be achieved in his sacrifice, the inclusion of Jew and Gentile, through the divine grace, to, the build, to build the divine family of grace, of which we can be very thankful. We are members. So this, this fourth sign of John's gospel is, is marvellous, isn't it? It's pointing to what we're doing here this morning. At the end of verse 11, it says this, And likewise of the small fishes, as it should read, as much as they would. This is an extremely important principle at the end of verse 11. This word would is the Greek word athelio. It has the idea of choosing or preferring or to be inclined towards. It actually means to have some kind of delight in, to be willing to go down a certain course, as much as they would. And brothers and sisters, that means that salvation ultimately depends on our willingness. You don't need to go very far to demonstrate that. Just go back one chapter in your Bible to John chapter 5 and verse 6. and You have this man with an infirmity for 38 years. In the third sign of John's Gospel, and it says in verse 6, When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Or as it could be better rendered, are you willing to be made healthy? And it all came back to choice. Are you willing to be made healthy? He can't do much for you if you're not. It's very, very important. And in actual fact, I won't have time to go into this, but in Mark's record, where Mark, of course, is writing for Romans, and there's a particular emphasis on Gentile salvation, in Mark's record, Mark chapter 8, the Lord gives his disciples a hiding because they had not understood what was accomplished in the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000 and the outcome of those two feedings. The feeding of the 5,000, they were principally Jews. The feeding of the 4,000, they were principally Gentiles. The feeding of the 5,000 saw 12 baskets. And you read about them. You read about them here in John chapter 6 and verses 12 and 13. And when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. And we pointed out the relationship of what is said here in verse 12 to what you find in verses 37 to 39. But he, he doesn't want to lose anything. Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves 
which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Now, that word for baskets is kofinos. It means a, a hand basket, something you put over your arm. You, know, you carry bread, loaves of bread in it. You know how many baskets that were left when the 4,000 Gentiles had done eating? Seven very small lunch hampers made out of reeds. Yeah. And the point that is being made, he says, don't you understand? When I fed the 5,000, how many baskets were left over? Well, 12 hand baskets, Lord, yes. And when I fed the 4,000, how many baskets were left over? Well, only seven little lunch bags that we had on our, on our waist. He said, well, don't you get it? No, well, we don't get it. That Gentiles would be hungrier for the word of God that came from his mouth than the Jews. That's the point. They were his people and they weren't listening. I'm the bread that came from heaven and you're not hungry. But the Gentiles, when they get this bread, will be very hungry. They don't live very much at all. That's the message. You see, brothers and sisters, it's all about willingness, isn't it? It's about willingness. How much are you going to leave? So we have this wonderful sign. And verse 14 says, Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. You know where that comes from, don't you? That's Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 and 19. And I need to take you back there. Just so hold your hand, hold your hand in John 6 and come back to Deuteronomy chapter 18. This is direct quotation or direct reference to these, these two verses in Deuteronomy 18. So in this 18th chapter, in verse 18, it says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, Moses, and will put my words, notice this, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Now that's exactly what happens in John chapter 6. Ye seek me not because of what I'm saying, but because your bellies were filled, he goes on to say in John 6, doesn't he? You're not following me because you want to listen to my words. So what does he do? He puts pressure on them. He talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And they were horrified by this. And when you come back to John 6, the answer is given, as we saw yesterday, in John 6 and verse 63. Verse 63 of the 6th chapter of John says, It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Yes, he was that prophet. They had that right, at least in John chapter 6, they had that much right. He was that prophet referred to in Deuteronomy chapter 18, who would speak God's words. The only problem was, that the Jews weren't hungry enough for them, didn't understand the meaning of them. So that's the fourth sign of John's Gospel, this, this uh, prefiguring of the memorial feast that we're keeping today. But then comes the fifth sign of John's Gospel from verse 15 onwards down to verse 21. And this is another marvellous sign. Verse 15 says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into the mountain himself alone. So what, what was the major event after the feast in the upper room and his death and resurrection? Well, his ascension to heaven, wasn't it? So what does he do? He departed again into the mountain himself alone. Yeah, This is, of course, prefiguring his ascension to the right hand of his father. And verse 16 says, And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea. You know, the disciples go down to the Sea of Galilee, Galilee of the nations. And they get into a, into a boat, verse 17, and they entered into the ship. 
Brothers and sisters, this is a remarkable parable of where we are today. Our Lord did ascend to his Father. He's been gone for some considerable time. And nobody would dispute the fact that the evening or the darkness has come. And you see, it says it was very dark in verse 17, and it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. That's exactly where we are today, aren't we? We're on the sea of nations, and there's going to be, uh, there is, and it's going to be even more violent storm in whatever time might remain. And that storm's not just from without. It's also within. There's a violent storm going on. See verse 18. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea. So get the picture in your mind. This is what this sign is about. It's a sign. It's designed for you and me at the end of the age. We are on the sea of nations. And we are in the ecclesial ecclesial ship. But the ecclesial ship is being tossed violently, isn't it? By wind and wave. Yes. And this this tossing around is having an effect. We are rowing very hard. I know a lot of ecclesias where the arranging brethren are rowing very, very hard. And some of them are not getting anywhere with the issues that are on their plate. That's where we are. And you see, this is described in in the language of the scripture. I want you to come to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. You you read in places like 2 Peter 2 and verse 17 of this as well. We might get a chance to have a look at that one as well. But Ephesians 4 and verse 14 says this, that we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Well, I think we've got a few of those winds of doctrine blowing around our community today. Yes. And there's a lot of cunning being used. They're using technology very well. Extremely cunning, they are. Yeah, we've got that problem. And you have a look at first of Peter uh, chapter, so, sorry, second of Peter chapter 2 and verse 17. It says this. Second Peter 2 and verse 17. He's describing a class of people that would emerge in the brotherhood in his times and when Jude writes his epistle he says it's happened. What Peter said was going to happen has happened. They're here. So what were they like? Verse 17. These are worlds without water, clouds they are carried with a tempest, clouds carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. So you see when you look at the scriptures, and there are many other references like that, you see that what's what's being said back here in John chapter 6 in this fifth sign, the fifth sign, brothers and sisters, the sign of grace, okay? What's being said here is a very important message for the last generation of Christadelphians. We find ourselves in an ecclesial ship on the sea of nations being rocked to and fro, and as hard as we row, we're not getting anywhere. But, they see Jesus walking on the water. And if you're watching the signs of the times, you know. You know he's coming. And he's not very far away. It's as though he's walking on the nations right now. He's sending his angels out there. He's manipulating the affairs of the nations. The signs are so prolific, brothers and sisters, you'd have to be foolish to think that Christ is is a long way away. He's walking on the nations. He's telling us he's about to arrive and he's going to stabilise the ecclesial ship. What are we going to do? Well, there's a record of Matthew 14 where Peter says, I want to hop out. He hops out and finds he can't handle it. You're much better off staying in the ecclesial ship even though it's being rocked with violent winds and tempests. You stay in the ecclesial ship. You're shortly... He will arrive. So the record goes on in verse 19 of John 6 and it says this. 
So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh. Yeah, he is. Drawing nigh to the ship. And they were afraid. Let me just let you in a little bit of a secret here. I'm not telling stories about anybody because this happens quite frequently. As some of you will be aware, I speak quite a bit about the events subsequent to the return of Christ and the judgment seat and so on and the signs of the times. I often have people come to me and say, oh, I'm a bit frightened by all this. I can understand that reaction. I can understand that. It's exactly what happens here. As the Lord draws nigh, they see him coming. He said, it is I, be not afraid. They were afraid. We've got to get rid of that, brothers and sisters. We've got to remove all fear. You know what that word is there? Afraid at the end of verse 19? It's phobio. We get an English word from phobio. It's phobia. Like claustrophobia, for example. It's a mindless fear. There's no reason for that sort of fear. This is the greatest thing that can ever happen to us. Is that Christ could turn up very soon. We have no reason to fear if, if our lives are in some kind of order. If our direction in life is right. We're not perfect. None of us are going to be perfect. You think that I feel that the the Lord won't put his finger on some problems in my... Of course, we've all got weaknesses and failings, but they can be forgiven. We all feel deficient as though we're not ready for the return of... There's always going to be someone in that state of mind, but don't have any fear because he's coming not to tip you out of the boat. He's coming to stabilise it and to give redemption to those that are therein. You know, you can't... I mean, look at the order of these signs. You've got the fourth sign. It's about the memorial feast, the, you know, the last supper. And you've got the next sign. It's about the next thing we expect, the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ in the earth to right the ecclesial ship. Verse 21. Then they willingly received him into the ship. You know what the literal Greek is there? They willed to receive him. And that's the spirit we should have. They willed to receive him. Their greatest desire was to receive him. That's the way we should be, brothers and sisters. They willingly received him into the ship. And immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. That's a miracle. How do you shift a 25-foot boat with 13 men in it from the middle of the Sea of Galilee to the shore at Capernaum? That's where they were going. They're going to Capernaum. How do you do that? In the same way that the angels are shortly going to remove us from wherever we might be to the place of judgment where we will end up where we want to be, at the place whither we're going. You know what Capernaum means, don't you? The city of comfort. And that's where we're going, to the city of comfort, to the glorified Zion. So you see, brothers and sisters, This is a very, very appropriate sign for you and me as we wait the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He isn't far away. There's no question about that. The signs are clear. He is not very far away. So what are we going to do in what time is left? Stay in the ship, even though it might be being rocked here and there. Stay in the ship and help those who are in it with us. Make sure that they don't jump out because that will be disaster. We're about to partake of bread and wine. And in John chapter 6, towards the end, the Lord, of course, gives us a very good introduction for what we're about to do. 
want to pick it up from verse 50 and just work down through here and talk a little bit about bread and wine and just wrap up our studies together in this subject of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Verse 50, he says, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Now we know what that bread is. We've seen that in our studies. He, t- he tells us that in verse 63. It's the words that came from his mouth. The word of God. I am the living bread, he says, verse 51, which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, if you listen to my teachings and my word, you'll live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now, this is where the Jews that were hearing him had a problem. Verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And it was horrifying to them to think of of, uh, cannibalism. But you see, brothers and sisters, they should have known better. Because, you see, under the law, there were six older offerings. Four of them were blood offerings, and the other two were bread and wine. There was the meal offering. And there was the drink offering of wine. You could not offer a burnt offering or a peace offering without also offering a meal and a drink. You know why that was the case? Well, because of sincerity and truth. A man could bring along an animal as a burnt offering. He could go through all the rituals. He could put his hand upon the offering and identify himself with it. Then it would be slain and it would be placed on the altar in a certain order head first, the fat that was around the vital organs second, then the innards and the legs third. And what he was saying to God was, I am going to give my life, I'm going to dedicate my life to you mentally, head, morally, the vital organs, the heart, etc., and physically, the innards and the legs, and walk away and do nothing about it. He couldn't do that. If you made a burnt offering, you had to make with it a meal offering of fine flour, which is what bread's made out of, and a drink offering of wine. You know why? Well, it was very simple to walk down to your herd or your flock and grab hold of an animal, put a a rope around its neck and lead it off to to the place where it was going to be sacrificed. Very simple, wasn't it? What sort of work's involved in that? But it's not so simple to produce fine flour and fine wine. You need to work for months to do that. You need to go out and plough the field, sow the seed, sit back, wait for it to grow. When it's fully grown, you've got to harvest it, and you've got to then, then you've got to thresh it, and you've got to winnow it, and then you've got to sift it, and then you've got to grind it. Yeah, it's like that with wine too, isn't it? A lot of hard work in that. And what God is saying to his people is, don't you dare make sacrifices to me of your intentions if you're not going to put the effort into it. It's a pretty powerful message, isn't it? So what did they do with the meal offering and the drink offering? Well, with the meal offering, it was offered, portion it was a handful given uh, uh, to Yahweh, and the rest fell to the priest. It all went to God in one form or another. It either went on the altar, which was God's table, that was his food, or it went to the priest, who was his representative. So one way or the other, it all went to God. It was not eaten by the ordinary Israelite. What about the wine, the drink offering? Well, that was poured out on the altar. Nobody touched that except God was given to him. So you see, the Jews should have had a comprehension of this. When he said, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, they should have known that under the law of Moses, bread and wine, the ordinary folk, the Israelite who made the... They didn't eat it. So he can't have meant that. He can't have meant eating literal flesh and blood, could he? But they didn't comprehend that. They didn't get it. So you see, bread. Bread we understand, don't we? What about blood? Well, this is what Brother John Carter says about the blood here. He says this, The blood is the life 
And the blood shed is the life given. We drink of his blood when we receive for his sake forgiveness of sins and share his fellowship with the Father. So life was represented, wasn't it, by blood. We know that from number 17 verse 11. So brothers and sisters, we're about to partake of bread and wine. Let's reconfirm the covenant, the commitment that we have made to our God. You know, there's no good reconfirming it if you've got no intentions of following it through. There's got to be a meal offering and a drink offering. And if nothing else comes out of this weekend that we've had together, I hope it will be this, that all of us will go away with a greater desire and intention to make the word of God even a bigger part of our life than what it is today. I happen to know at home and in my travels that the reading of the word of God, which used to be a huge part of our community, is not like it was of old. We're losing it. And if we lose the daily reading of the word of God, we are jeopardising our future. That's the simple message that should come out of this study of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Except he eat my flesh and drink my blood, this man could say. He has no life in him.